I am so honored to share the stage with these two incredible curators uh, with whom I have been having just very rich conversations about Francesca Woodman's work as well as many other art, work of many other artists. And so we're hoping to just kind of share that with all of you today and looking forward to your questions later. And of course, um, to hearing the uh, experiences and anecdotes and um, observations of the next three speakers after us. So let's kick it off, you guys. Um, one thing that has been really interesting to me to kind of learn a little bit more about as a result of this exhibition is to really get into the kind of status of photography in the late 70s when Francesca Woodman was making the work that we have upstairs. So I'm hoping that you guys could kind of paint a picture for us about what that context of um, a really kind of like the status of the photographic object of the print itself at that time and, and kind of maybe demonstrate a little bit to us how it might be different from the way we conceive of it today. Mm -hmm. So those it's are two a big, big yeah, topic. that's a huge topic. <laughs> yeah, two specific questions in there, which I think we can both yeah. talk to. But one is sort of the general context around the kind of perceived value of photography, um, and then the sort of value of a photograph as an object, of the thing. Um, and I came prepared with a, a little thing to read very quickly that I think will give a it. It was, a, it was a statement that I found very um, helpful long ago in understanding this field, and I think it'll be useful. So Charlie Traub, who, the longtime chair of the photo department at SVA in New York, recalled the 70s. He was asked to recall the 70s for a publication, and he said, to be published in one of the few successful art photography journals, such as Aperture, Camera Arts, or Album, was the first step toward photographic immortality a one-person exhibition in the rare museum or gallery that showed photography, or the purchase of a photograph by someone other than a relative, <laughs> was a major coup. To have a monograph made, one had to be close to the grave or in it. The idea of making a living from the sale of one's own photographs was still a dream. And that really sums up what a lot of people who were emerging as students or younger photographers in the 70s have also told me that it just they knew they would have to make a living in some other way um, and were just hoping one day somebody would show a photograph um, outside of their own school or somebody would buy it beyond their mother. I mean, it's the decade in which a lot of museums uh, start forming photography departments. It's a decade in which a lot of schools outside of art schools um, start forming art uh, photography programs within them. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think um, there's a number of major private collectors, corporations that start collecting photography in the 1970s. You think of the Hallmark Collection, mm -hmm. um, Sam Wagstaff, who was partners with Maplethorpe, started collecting in the early 70s. He himself was a curator of contemporary art and sold all of his major paintings in the early 70s because he realized photography was the most exciting. But what all those collectors focused on was really 19th century and early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So those were, in a way, unique or more unique objects. You couldn't, I guess one could go back to the negatives if you could find them and make contemporary prints, but it's not like it was a living artist that could just continue to make prints. So that was a very controlled, finite market, mm -hmm. which meant that it, when those people started collecting the works, Sam Wagstaff, for example, um, purchased at auction in London uh, a portfolio of, I think, 80 prints by um, Julia um, Margaret Cameron. Um, and that went for like $130,000 in 1974, which was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And it's really what put um, you know, the photography market in the, the eyes of the general public. And I think the my favorite film from the 1970s to talk about photography in the market is The Eyes of Laura Mars. Is that mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. The Eyes of Laura um, with Faye Dunaway. Mm -hmm. uh, and she plays a commercial fashion photographer mm -hmm. Uh, that's sort of based on Helmut Newton, but there's she ends up having a show, and there's you know there's this scene where she's being interviewed for um, uh, for a tele for a TV spot, um, and they talk about how hot the the photo market is. Um, but that was a fairly recent phenomenon, and it, especially when it came to living artists, um, you think of Museum of Modern Art, John Tarkowski, 
most of the shows he mounted in the 60s and 70s with photographers whose work would have been more from the 1930s but were still living, he, they just made new prints. You know, they didn't, they didn't go back and find vintage prints. There wasn't this idea that the way in which today curators, collectors, uh, are connoisseurs of prints. Um, you know, there was, there was no idea that, you know, that, and so many of them, you know, they weren't even made f to be on the wall anyway. Mm -hmm. um, they were meant for publications, they were meant for other purposes. Um, so, so the intention of the photographer when making that work wasn't that it would be produced and framed and hung right. on a wall. Right, or I mean, it, or, it, had, it had multiple, right? So Walker Evans, for example, what did have shows in the 1930s at the Museum of Modern Art and other uh, other spaces? So certainly he, you know, many photographers did aspire to that even in the 1930s, but there were few opportunities. So mm -hmm. a lot of them produced the work for the printed page, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, that it's that in itself was a fairly new medium that could be distributed and reach a lot more people. Um, so of course you're also going to want to explore. I mean the way the way I frame it to a lot of people who are in, like more interested in contemporary art, uh, especially in the 1930s, thinking about photography, and say, um, well, if, if you were an avant-garde artist in the 20s, 30s, you're one, you're going to want to use the most um, new technologies, mm -hmm. and in the same way that you think of the avant-garde in the 1970s, and if they're using video. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me is like a good analogy. Mm -hmm. Um, but it didn't mean that, yeah, there, but with photography, there's just so many ways in which the work can be distributed and, and shown. Um, but obviously the market controls that right. by the 1970s. Well, and in the 70s, in terms of actually wanting somebody to look at your prints, I mean, today, if you're a grad student, you might go to a, um, a photo fair, a portfolio review, you might visit a whole bunch of different galleries and show your work. Um, but those, that kind of infrastructure wasn't there in the 70s. And even in New York City, there, were, there was Whitkin Gallery that was founded in 69. There's Lake Gallery in 71. Those are sort of, that's sort of it for a while. But there really weren't many galleries, like, on the whole at that time either. Right. It was, but, I mean, it was much fewer than what existed. Sure, yeah. sure. And, but there overall, weren't right. these. Overall. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but there was no sort of, you know, submit your portfolio to critical mass even, just, just the regular kind of, uh, there's just an overwhelming number of reviews and things now that just weren't there. Well, yeah. I think one of the things that, one of the reasons why I wanted to get into this uh, topic was because when you enter the exhibition upstairs, we did a very deliberate kind of highly theatrical thing, which is to blow up photographs that George had made of Francesca's loft and studio um, so that you could see what it was like to enter that space in the moment when she was making all the work that we see in the other galleries. And the idea of walking into a space that's like littered with all <laughs> of these prints and letters and ephemera and who knows what else um, speaks to a, a um, kind of a treatment of or a conception of the print that is not precious, right? Um, and so what you guys are alluding to and, and kind of deepening our awareness of is the lack of preciousness kind of of the, the, printed, the printed object, if you will. I think that's true. I also think, as Sloan said last night, the ones on the ground were not kind of the selects, mm -hmm. right? They were... Work prints. They were work prints, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're in the dark room and you have this pack of 25 sheets of paper or whatever, um, it's hard to get the print you want, and right. you don't know what it's going to look like <laughs> till the next day when the print is dry, and you're in a group darkroom at a university where if somebody puts a couple drips of the fixer into the developer, your prints are going to be muddy, and that whole day is wasted, and they go on the floor. And there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, and, you know, something that I, th that I haven't even told you yet, because I just found this out. I know, breaking oh. news. Um, <laughs> it's not really news. It's just Spoiler. A, kind of a nuance of her of uh, Francesca Woodman's kind of process, but I spoke with the curator who did the show at Addison Gallery in 76, oh. mm -hmm. and that was sort of her first solo show. And she was still a student, and he well, said- It happened after she had left Andover. She was at, yes. at RISD, but- Yes, yes. Not, not so, at Andover anymore. Right, there's a whole connection because this curator was actually her teacher at Phillips, in 73, 74, but he was half-time teacher, half-time curator, so back 
the Edison Gallery, which is the Gallery of Phillips. Um, she, he told me that she would print the same, from the same negative in a variety of ways. So darker, lighter, there was some burning and dodging going on, most likely. Um, and then she asked for his advice in selecting the prints that would be in the exhibition. So there would be m many varieties of the same mm -hmm. image printed, and then the, you know, the, what you saw on the floor were the ones that weren't, weren't ultimately. Didn't make the cut. Yeah. Right. But also, obviously, you know, for so many contemporary, even today, right, the way in which photographs are now additioned, which helps control the market. Um, mm -hmm. But if you purchase a photograph from, um, say, by Cindy Sherman, uh, the print itself is not what is a value. I mean, it is and it isn't because you get a certificate of authenticity with that work. Mm -hmm. And without the certificate of authenticity, the work is valueless. Or if you have the certificate of authenticity and anything happens to it, Cindy or the gallery could always reprint, reprint it. it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's now structures around that that mm -hmm. help sort of maintain the market, but also it's not just the print, right? Because that, mm -hmm. that, is, that is replaceable by materials, unless it's a unique process or, you know, obviously there are many artists who use photographic materials that are unique right. um, in the way they print it or in the way they alter it. Um, but um, for, for example, I mean, Cindy, when she was, Cindy Sherman, when she was starting out in the early, the late 70s, early 80s, she, she was selling her prints for $50. Um, and by the 90s, when MoMA purchased the whole set of um, untitled film stills, I think it was for over a million. A million dollars, yeah. So that's, in, that was That was a course, real inflection point too, right? Yes, and that was, that was a major turning point. It was, mm -hmm. Um, partially because that sort of type of photography, mo the photo department at MoMA had largely ignored. And so even though it was only a decade later, they had to do some major catching up. And within that, it was really the early 90s when the market, especially for contemporary photography, mm -hmm. exploded. Can you guys talk a little bit for us about what some of the kind of main, if you, if you can use this kind of large um, kind of paintbrush, but... Um, Sorry to mix metaphors. Uh, uh, <laughs> the currents kind of in photography at this time. So kind of what the ideas, issues, trends, challenges that artists were, the photographers were trying to kind of confront and address in this moment, and then maybe how that would relate to Woodman's project. I have a lot to say about that, <laughs> but I've, you should go first this time. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, what I think, you know, in my essay, I, I, the title is Seething with Ideas, which is what um, Francesca writes in, a, in a, notes or, a, a note or letter that she's seething with ideas. And I sort of use that analogy for photography in the 1970s, too, because I think it's one of the most productive periods, both in a sort of discursive way, in a critical way, um, but also in this sort of in pushing against really um, the narratives of the history of photography that had been written in the previous decade and then throughout the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so many different artists producing work, experimenting different practices. So mm -hmm. I think she enters into a really fruitful period and her work um, is definitely very aligned with some that are maybe lesser well-known and I'm sure you can talk about that. Um, and, and then, and so what I think is interesting about Francesca, obviously, is that she is very well connected. So, um, and I'm by no means a scholar on Francesca Woodman, although I, no, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> although I learned a lot um, by, um, by writing the essay. Um, and, and so she's, you know, she's connected through her parents to Max Kozlov, who's the editor-in-chief of Art Forum. And while she's at RISD, um, from, I think he's there from 75 to 77, um, and he commissions a number of major essays on photography. He does a special issue in 76 on, on photography um, and is commissioning other, other artists such as Alan Sakula and Martha Rosler who represent one sort of strain of photographic practices in the 1970s where mm -hmm. They're blending conceptual art practices with a, sort of a history of socially engaged documentary. Um, and that is pushing against John Tcharkowski's own formation of documentary or new documents at MoMA, which foregrounds people like Diane, Diane Arbus and, and Lee Friedlander <coughs> and Gary Winogrand. Um, so 
Um, so for sure, you know, Francesca's work does not look like somebody like Martha Rosler or, or Alan Sukula, but in a way they're both pushing against a sort of a certain narrative with, that's been formed within the um, established art world, where, which by, by which I mean publications like Art Forum, October, um, that is maybe from our perspective today has written a lot of the history of mm -hmm. contemporary art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right. So I think that there's this, um, there was this construction sort of in the 80s and 90s, looking back and thinking about what was going on in the 70s as sort of the photographers were doing this and the artists who happened to use photography were doing this. But in fact, I think, and I've seen uh, lots and lots of evidence of more of a continuum there, and it was really, they were dealing with a lot of the same concerns, but it was, bringing that up would have made all of those arguments sort of difficult. Um, and so I try to just think of people, and so this is a really silly way to look at it, but in the late 60s, I kind of think of counterculture in general and everybody sort of, you know, uh, college guys growing their hair long because their dad hated it. And in photography, the dad was Ansel Adams and modernism. And I know this is silly. I just to heard say. someone say, ugh. I know, I'm sharing with you sort of no, how no. I explain this to myself. And, 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 and this is sort of what I've gathered by reading all of these different things people were writing to each other around that time. And, and ultimately it comes down to sort of this rejection of what they were being told is and is not photography. And I'm talking about photographers um, at a lot of different universities. And again, as, has, as was mentioned in the catalog and, and as some of us, maybe all of us know, I mean, this is the time, the 60s and the 70s is the time when people are starting to be able to even get an MFA for the first time. That just wasn't really an option. Photography was really offered in the journalism department or criminal justice sometimes. The darkroom was in, like, with the police because they were, yeah. So uh, it wasn't in the art department. So th this is for the first time, uh, you know, people are studying photography within an art department, which means they're also sort of proximate to painters and people drawing, and, and they're, they're sharing kind of spaces with artists. Um, but within photography, there's already all these ruptures going on that sort of aren't acknowledged by critics outside of photography. Um, but there's a lot of different, um, I think, just to put a really, you know, just to lump some people together, there's people like Tom Barrow and Ken Josephson who are drawing attention to that kind of, it's not a window on the world, it's not a cat, it's a picture of a cat, and I'm gonna show you that it's a picture. Um, that kind of a thing, there's a lot of media critique going on. I mean, Heineken's being shown from the 60s. He wasn't, you know, rediscovered in 2014 or whatever that show was. Um, there are women doing really interesting things. You know, if the silver print is the master of photography, the modernist print, they're doing everything but silver and even making fun of the notion of silver by making prints of the Lone Ranger, hi ho silver, but not in silver. They're sewing into those works bringing in domestic craft associated with women's work to kind of nudge the male-dominated kind of modernist, uh, you know, photography kind of structure. So all of this is going on in the decade before Woodman um, starts to make photographs, and this is what she would have been seeing by looking at the issues of aperture in the school library. And I know that she was looking at that with her teachers even back in high school. To what extent do you see an aspect of her creative project being kind of chafing against like the very medium of photography itself, like trying to bump up against what photography maybe had been and really what it could be? She uses all of these props and objects that, that similarly like reflect and crop and frame and um, so that the image that we get in the end has all these kind of dimensions to it or layers to it that a kind of straight photograph you know, clearly doesn't have. Um, to what extent do you see her, like, um, I don't want to say her objective that's too linear, but kind of one of the things that she was working through is a kind of to push beyond the bounds of, of her medium? I don't. It, I yeah, don't. I think it's, like, as you were saying, Jessica, I think um, so much of, of photography in the 1970s was Re, in some times, some artists were rediscovering early 20th century artists or 19th century artists. Mm -hmm. um, so not to say that it was a continuous history because not those histories came and, you know, they mm -hmm. came and went and they were being rediscovered constantly. Right. 
But again, 1970s is this moment partially because of the collecting of photography mm -hmm. where certain Victorian photographers yeah. were rediscovered, rediscovered, um, and major monographs came out mm -hmm. in the early 70s. So Francesca would have had would have had access mm -hmm. to those publications where you wouldn't have been able to see the work before. Yeah. So, um, so in some ways what she's doing is maybe not um, totally new within the history of photography, but certainly people wouldn't have had access to the images in the way they did uh -huh. in the 1970s. Right. Um, uh, pr prior. Pr prior to that. Mm -hmm. well, that makes a lot of sense. And she's taking little bits from all different places and any one of us could do that, but then what do you do with it next? And yeah. that's where we get the, you know, her work. So it's not that she's modeling her work after a particular person, but she's taking all these different things. I mean, in, you know, uh, there are, there were group shows, the catalogs for which were definitely at the RISD library um, with all kinds of examples of, you know, nude women in the woods with mirrors over their faces and all kinds, I mean, uh, we could just list on and on and on. And that would all, that was all in 68, 69, 70. So that was accessible mm -hmm. to her. It doesn't mean she copied that because that's not what her work looked right. like. But those different, her, I can, you know, I didn't, I didn't know her, but you can imagine an artist's mind just kind of like, ooh, that and that and that, and just all of this kind of accumulation of all of this, um, you know, inspiration, if you want to call it that. But she was curious, she went to the library, she also, you know, went to the MFA Boston and saw shows like the 1974 show you mentioned. She probably yeah. saw that show, and right. there's the Yulesman on the cover, you know, that was a very wild kind of show. And so she's just absorbing all of this. And her teacher that I talked to said she was like a sponge, right. you know? And so, but what do you do with all of that stuff? Some of us wouldn't be able to come up with any ideas. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> I'll become an art historian. <laughs> or if you're an artist, you then turn that into something else productive. And that's what I think Right. Well, I, I think, yeah. And I think what's ahead, so Jeff. nice about the show, this you know, this sort of period, is that you can see that experimentation and that totally. playfulness, and that it's drawing upon her own experiences. But certainly, we can imagine. Obviously, I didn't know her either, but you can imagine that she's also trying things out that she's seeing in books and exhibitions um, in her own visual language. Absolutely, I, I've confessed this to many people who I've walked through the exhibition with, but it took me an an obscene amount of time to write the essay that I wrote for the book because I kept trying to put all of the material into this kind of, you know, I tried to wrap it with a bow and it just kept resisting and kept resisting that because it really, you know, because the material was accumulated in a, not in a linear way, you can't kind of impose that linear structure on it. And once I kind of said, oh wait, there, you know, this is, kind of an amorphous thing and they're, they're so, that's like so beautiful that it is that because what it does is it affords us to glance the many different kind of avenues and paths that she was exploring and pursuing and no, we don't have any kind of resolution on, on kind of any of these one paths and some we have a little more information on than others but it really introduces us to that kind of multiplicity of interests and ideas, seething with ideas really as she was. Um, Beca uh, and that that's the kind of real kind of gem of the entire project upstairs is that it, um, it allows us to kind of um, start to consider some of these things mm -hmm. kind of more deeply. And I think that idea of um, kind of glimpsing her process a little bit, which is what a lot of the work kind of gives us access to, because it feels like we have feels like, I don't want to claim anything beyond that really, but that we have some kind of steps along the way. Like we know the final image of the three women, Francesca, Sloan, and another friend with the you know, photograph of Francesca in front of their faces. Um, and upstairs we have something around that. I don't know if it was before, I don't know if it was after, but it clearly is a step in that. And it's meaningful because especially for an artist like Woodman, who I, I think for so many people, she's just this like completely enigmatic figure who has taken on a kind of mythic quality almost at this point. Um, for us to see kind of a little bit into how, how things worked uh, is incredibly meaningful. So on that point, um, I, to, I don't know if this is kind of building off of what you were saying, Drew, or if it's taking it in a totally different direction. I don't think it really is. But um, just um, how does her work kind of, if you can, like extend 
or advance some of those conversations that you guys were talking about, about what's happening in the 70s? Like, how do we take kind of what's simmering around and, and kind of see it put into play in her work? I think, you know, I was sort of suggesting maybe is that she's experimenting and pulling from the way so many artists do, sure. right? They sort of, you know, you see this here, you see this here, and you combine it in different ways that creates something completely completely new. Mm -hmm. But I also think about the, you know, I think whether, we were talking about obviously the, the first show after her death is in 1986 at, um, at the Davis. Wellesley, isn't it? Uh, is it Wellesley? It wasn't Wellesley the Davis yet, but it was, right. yeah. But I would, you know, I've talked to artists that would have been practicing after that, like Lyle Ashton Harris, mm -hmm. who talks about, and he would have been an undergrad then, yeah. um, how, in, how important Woodman was for him. Um, and he started producing while he was an undergrad at Wesleyan, um, self-portraits, where he was performing, playing in front of the camera. Um, and for him as a queer black man in the 1980s, that was really transformative to be able to put yourself in, to put yourself in a picture, perform, create an image. Um, and I think that's in a way what for a lot of people um, who found her work in the 1980s, what her work opened up mm -hmm. um, for a new generation of mm -hmm. artists. That sort of freedom mm -hmm. and ability to, um, to put oneself in, in the image and use yourself as your own medium. That's great. Um, speaking of kind of, maybe we're like kind of belaboring the point, but I did, um, one of the things that comes up often in um, conversations around the work upstairs is whether or not these are self-portraits. Um, to what extent is she, because she's figuring herself so frequently, um, and I think Sloan is the one who would recall that Francesca used to say that, you know, she always, she, you know, the reason why she's in all of her pictures is because she was always available. <laughs> Forgive me if I've butchered the quote in any way. <laughs> But the gist is that, you know, it was that kind of flippant retort to the question. But right. um, what are your guys, what are your thoughts on that? I have a sense that I, I, I'm hesitant a little bit, because I kind of want to, I mean, I, I wasn't, I don't, there's nothing sort of on the record. That's kind of the closest thing we have. I do have... I do know other women in particular who have said that to me about mm -hmm. their work in the 70s. Uh -huh. Um, and it had a lot to do with, um, they had limited time, sometimes they had children, so while their children were napping, they went up to their studio and they made like, a, you know, some work quick, and they didn't, have, they didn't have the money to hire a model. Now, when you're in a student environment, that's, you don't have to often, you know, I don't know, <laughs> did she pay you, Sloan? No. Um, but it's, it's convenient, because you all, I think that my understanding, again, and I don't want to project I don't want to imagine that I would know, but my, the descriptions that artists working in the 70s have given to me is they were working intuitively, they had an idea, they wanted to do it right now, or they, didn't, they, they needed to embody the idea and, and not explain it to somebody over, you know, no, I'm trying to get this, because then you have to articulate it in language that isn't the language you're thinking in, it's mm -hmm. this intuitive thing, and so for you to be doing it yourself is just a much more direct way of getting the result you want, and it's not necessarily about you in a not a biographical sense, it's about, um, yeah, you, you need a figure in that picture, and it's easiest to explain it to yourself quickly, and right. it's just functional, but I also don't want to say that it's that Francesca Woodman didn't make self-portraits kind of equivocally or right. wasn't being autobiographical because I'm not I that seems like that's a little bit crazy it's, right. what's that but idea you, about um the the simplest answer is always like the closest <laughs> to being correct right well I mean I think of I mean obviously in the history of art there's a lot of examples Rembrandt you know you can think of so many self-portraits but mm -hmm. are they really self-portraits obviously he did them oftentimes just to paint when he was in between commissions. So it was a way he was available, he mm -hmm. could look at, at a mirror and paint himself and experiment with um, representation. So, you know, I think, um, I think there's a long tradition of, of using oneself 
and whether that's self-portraiture or not. I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, even those terms are art, there's terms that art historians use anyway. So I don't, I don't know, I guess maybe it doesn't We matter. like make up the problems <laughs> right. that then we have to solve. And then we deconstruct them. Yeah. Yeah. So then you have to define self And we've been a lot of years in the library working on it. Yeah. Um, looking at uh, the kind of network that, that mm. Francesca Woodman was a part of, and we're obviously gonna hear a kind of more personal and kind of intimate network of her friends later on, but in terms of the photography network that she was a part of, um, and, and what that might have, how expansive or not that might have been at the time that she was making mm -hmm. work. Can you share mm -hmm. with us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about photography in the 70s as, I mean, there were, it was still a field that was sort of outside of the mainstream art world, and um, there were leaders who kind of emerged in, in, in a sense that, uh, okay, so the institutions aren't going to accept us, let's found our own institutions. And that's why you get things like the Society for Photographic Education, which sounds like such a <laughs> nerdy club for camera nerds or something, but was actually, you know, headed or sort of uh, connected universities and circulated exhibitions. And, and the people we're talking about is, you know, Siskind and Callahan were and Heineken, and you know, John Tchaikovsky was at the first few meetings, and so we're not talking, you know, SBE has become kind of this grad student place, which is productive in a lot of ways, but it, it started in the 60s as a place for these photographers who also ran, who taught at, you know, universities to, to, to be able to talk to each other, because long distance calls were expensive, mm -hmm. and email didn't exist, and, and they, did, they wanted to know what they were doing, and they also wanted to, get a sense of the field to kind of legitimize their activities for reluctant uh, university presidents or museum directors. And so um, this was actually this, this sort of network of communication that was incredibly critical. And it was also a network along which, you know, publications circulated. And, you know, the Eastman House was very important. That was also the hub of sort of the founding of SPE. And they had this membership kind of plan, so nobody ever, who goes to Rochester as a tourist? Nobody, zero people. But if you're a member of the Eastman House as a person who, had, who was just grasping for anything in photography, you would get all of those museum publications every year to your library, and so all those publications were definitely at RISD. I know that they were at Phillips. Um, and so this network was incredibly important to see kind of what was going on, and it also helped you to get any kind of opportunity, because we've talked about how there were no kind of portfolio reviews and that kind of thing, and so I don't really know what to make of this, and, and I think the next presentation will be maybe useful if anybody wants to talk about this, but um, I, I, was, I was struck by the way, so, so Francesca Woodman in 72 goes to Abbott and she has Wendy Snyder McNeil as a teacher. Her brother's teaching at Phillips. When the two schools consolidate, now her brother, Don Snyder, is her teacher. And he's half-time teaching and half-time curator. So then a couple of years go by and now Francesca's at RISD. And then after a year, uh, Wendy Snyder McNeil's teaching at RISD. And then her first show is at the Addison Gallery, Don Snyder. And I'm not saying that it's because of them that, you know, but I'm just saying you had to have connections and show your work to somebody who could recognize it and do something about it. And that is just what you had to do for anybody, really, um, in, that, in that time. It was really... Well, it's still true today, to to say. <laughs> Well, right, right, absolutely. I feel like... But maybe small, it was smaller back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that so many people, if that was the only way you could really get any traction, and then what if you didn't have it, either of those people? Um, and so I think we have to be careful, and I'm being careful not to say that it was because of them that she had talent, because that's not at all what I'm saying, but I'm just saying that there was this small world, and I guess the thing I kind of want to say is that there, it, it seems to me from reading lots and lots of letters from the time and talking to lots and lots of people who were there, that there was a sense, and this might be kind of utopian and weird, and I'm sure they left out a lot of people, but there was a sense of if somebody was really uh, kind of a believer that they would help you, like people wanted to help you, maybe more now, uh, more than, than they have the time to do now, that there are so many more people involved. But um, I've also heard some different things from 
George and Sloan in the last couple of days. So we can talk about that. To, like, to what extent, what were those relationships? It seems like those relationships were much more complicated than I was aware, and I'm glad to know that. So, um, network was important. <laughs> and still is. And still is, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. done. Um, one other thing I want to kind of get your thoughts on is um, the, the kind of documentation or the ephemera that we have on view, the letters and the postcards, you know, the announcements for her exhibitions that have actual prints on them that she taped up around Providence or, um, you know, the letters to George on, on the back of prints that she put through the mail. Like, can you help us understand, was that a radical move at the time or was it, I don't want to say de rigueur, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like the the 2019 eyes that see this think, oh my gosh, how could she have put a print of hers through the mail? And you know, so if you can kind of bridge that, I just that got a decades. note from Jerry Ullsman on a print like a couple months ago, <laughs> and I it's folded in half and I was writing all over it, and he was sending me something else and just stuck it in there because it was probably in his garbage bin as a reject print, and he just wrote it on there. It's like taking a scratch paper out of the recycling almost and just using it, right? And if you, I mean, I think you've had the same thing. If, like, if I go, and don't do this because, well, maybe you'll all do it now, but if you go into, like, the, just the info files at Eastman House, mm. you'll go through, you'll just pick out a file, you know, uh, well, Frank Golke, I don't know, whatever. I'm just thinking about shows that were there. And there's all the, half the correspondence in every folder is written on a print. <laughs> because it's just what was around, and it was more fun, and it was interesting, and there was, like, community, you were kind of in the know with photographers. Hey, it's a, yeah. I don't know. But even, I mean, even prints in museum collections, like MoMA's, yeah. if you go through MoMA's collection, so, much, so many things that came in, especially before, I would say, the 1970s probably, um, or before the 1980s, ha you know, they have notes in writing. You know, there, mm -hmm. are, there mm -hmm. are notes to John Tchaikovsky on the back of them. Um, and that, you know, again, because they weren't, and you can see, you know, it was like 25 dollars or less than a dollar for some of the prints, mm -hmm. um, including works by Ansel Adams. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so I, again, I think it goes back to this idea of um, a print not being so precious. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you go to APAD or go to any, just, or just any photo dealer, how many of the prints you're looking at, if you lift up the mat, it's a Christmas card? You know, I mean, every museum has like the Christmas card photo collection because they all sent Christmas photo photographs that mm -hmm. they printed 50 of them and sent them to all the curators that were there, also their friends. And then they just stuck them somewhere and, and then in, around, you know, 1998, <laughs> somebody said, oh, those should probably be in the collection, not in the office, you know, just like under the coffee mug or whatever. You know, that vintage print by Siskin from 64 should probably not be right. just in, over there in the folder, in the, uh, in the non-archival, you know, office folder. It should probably be. Well, I think it kind of gets to the point um, that we kind of started with, really, which is the market. And how the market is, you know, all consuming in a sense. And so it will it will take these it will take these Christmas card, you know, prints <laughs> and ephemera that were maybe intentionally sent not necessarily as precious items and the market will consume it as a a very valuable object. And so I think that you know I, I love to always say, you know, I'm at, we are a non-collecting museum. We don't really have to hew to market, you know, conditions or expectations or valuations really other than our insurance. You know, we can really be so high-minded and like so <laughs> removed from it. But really, obviously, the market is just like a key um, uh, kind of thread in the quilt that is any kind of artist project or whether that's an exhibition or a book or what have you in terms of the valuation. And what's, what's um, so fascinating is the, the idea of artists, um, you've kind of helped us kind of connect back to the moment of, you know, printing, dropping on the ground, printing again. I mean, George the other night was talking about how the, the dark rooms at RISD were a mess. If you could get one clean print, like, it was a good luck charm because that never happened. Like, that that, that was, you know, the kind of movement through, the, the printing was kind of almost like the, the less important step because it was the the making of the work, the capturing of something that was kind of more valued. And so, but now here we are where the, 
the physical material thing is getting so much more value than it was created with. Mm -hmm. And how we kind of reconcile those two. I don't know that they are reconcilable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, we are just about out of our time, unless there are any kind of parting uh, observations or questions to kind of leave, to put out um, any other points that you kind of want to make sure we address before we cede the stage to the really interesting people. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. yeah, why take up any more time? Yeah. Right, for the yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, you guys, thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful thoughts and ideas. It's thank been you. really, really informative. We are going to break for about 10 minutes and then we will reconvene back here with a whole new set of characters on the stage. <laughs> um, and then we'll do questions after that. Thank you. Thank you.